Hello, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Before we begin, we would like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets. Expand each widget by clicking on the Maximize icon at the top right of the widget or by dragging the bottom right corner of the widget panel. Additional materials, including a copy of today's slide deck, is available in the resource list widget, indicated by the green file icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click the purple Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your questions. You can submit questions anytime throughout the webinar. You do not have to wait to the very end. If you have any technical difficulties, click on the Help widget. The question mark icon it covers common technical issues. You can also submit technical issues via the Q&A widget. Please note, most technical issues are solved by pressing F5 or Command-R on Mac. Pressure player console. Finally, an on demand version of this webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast using the same audience links. In a full 508 compliant version of this webcast will be available on Realm Atlantic website in approximately two minutes. Now I'd like to introduce Brian Gill. Brian, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Brian. And thanks to all of you for joining us today uh, for this webinar on learning remotely in the age of COVID-19. This webinar is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education's Mid-Atlantic Regional Educational Laboratory. My name is Brian Gill. I'm the director of RHEL Mid-Atlantic, which is operated by Mathematica. As we're all deeply aware, COVID-19 has forced the closure of school buildings across the country, but children still need to learn course, and educators are working overtime to find ways to make sure that happens. Schools and districts have never faced anything like this before, though, and uh, many of them are struggling to identify and implement effective approaches to remote learning. Tackling this issue head-on is especially important um, given that uh, students who struggle with in-person instruction are even more likely to struggle with an online format. During today's webinar, we'll talk about an exploratory literature scan um, aiming to connect educators with research and discuss related issues about equity for all students. Now, it's important to mention that this webinar builds on a workshop that was hosted last week by our colleagues at the Midwest Regional Educational Laboratory. That webinar focused on research-based resources and considerations for um, virtual learning. Both of these events are part of a larger series of webinars, blog posts, and other products for educators, for parents, for administrators that collectively represent really an unprecedented collaborative effort across all 10 regional educational laboratories spanning the country. And you can find a link that lists all of those upcoming products and activities in that resource list widget that Brian Willis just mentioned. For today's webinar, we've got three goals. First, we're aiming to connect with what research says and what it doesn't say about practices and approaches that support rem remote learning. Second, we'll present a framework to help inform decision making for educators as they respond to the need to implement remote learning systems. And third, will highlight some approaches to addressing equity concerns that are magnified by the closures of school buildings. As the session proceeds, feel free to share your question in the Q&A box um, that Brian mentioned before. And at the end of the session, we'll have, we should have plenty of time for our team of presenters to, uh, to respond to a number of questions. We'll get to as many as we can um, before our time is up. So with that, uh, I want to briefly uh, introduce today's presenters. Um, we have three esteemed presenters today. Heather Bennett is Director of School Equity Services for the Pennsylvania School Boards Association. Felicia Hurwitz and Steve Malik are both staff on RHEL Mid-Atlantic and researchers at Mathematica. And uh, now I will hand the presentation over to Steve to get us started. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'd like to overview the plan for today. So first, we'd like to take a few moments to get to know all of you and who's joining us today. 
Then we'll provide some context for how districts in our region are responding to the sudden school closures and describe strategies that districts across the country are implementing right now. We'll then share the results of our exploratory literature review and highlight some of the most promising practices educators can use uh, to meet the needs of their students during current school closures. Finally, we'll explore strategies to promote equity for students in the age of remote learning. But we'd like to get to know who you are. So we'd like to learn who's joining us today. On your screen, um, you should see a uh, widget pop up or a little poll, and we're asking you to select the option that best describes the role, your role at your organization. Go ahead and take about 30 seconds, and then we'll share out the results of that. All right, let's see who's joining us today. So it looks like we have folks from the whole gamut of um, different roles. So we have teachers here, about 10% of us are teachers, about 5% of us are school-based coaches with another 4% being school-based administrators. We have district administrators and state administrators, technical assistance providers, and a whole bunch of researchers and policy analysts. Thank you all for joining us today. So before we get too far, we want to make sure that we're on the same page about some of the terms that we're going to be using during today's webinar. We use the term remote learning to talk about all the education that is happening outside the classroom. This remote learning includes everything from online instruction to paper and pencil learning with packets. In this way, we can think of remote learning and distance learning as synonymous. One aspect of this work is its synchronicity, that is whether the learning is synchronous and teachers and students are interacting in real time at the same time, or whether learning is asynchronous and students and teachers are completing their academic work, or excuse me, that students are completing their academic work without the direct interaction of their teacher in real time. In our current context, we can think of the educational packets that many students are completing as a form of asynchronous remote learning. We also use the term virtual learning to describe all learning that relies on some form of technology such as a Chromebook, a laptop, or a tablet. Now I'm gonna hand things off to Felicia to discuss the current context of school closures. Thanks, Steve. So first, we can't proceed further without acknowledging the hard work that educators in our region and across the nation are doing in a time of crisis. Our goal is to provide promising practices informed by evidence information to help guide educators recognizing that we are living under what can feel like impossible circumstances. Before we dive into our findings, we just wanted to highlight some examples of what schools are doing within the, Mid the Mid-Atlantic region and beyond. So there are some various approaches that I wanna highlight that large districts are taking in the Mid-Atlantic region. And this slide depicts just a few examples. First, districts are providing a variety of resources for remote learning, including instructional packets, online and via paper, support for office hours, and access to devices. Schools are also thinking about equity concerns, including providing special guidance for students with disabilities and resources to support special education teachers with remote learning. You will notice that other types of equity concerns aren't listed here. For example, supporting students experiencing homelessness. If a population of students is not listed on this table, it does not necessarily mean that the district isn't thinking about or supporting this group's needs. We were just limited by the information we could find. And finally, we could see that schools in our region are working hard to provide support for physical and social emotional wellness, including instructional packets and other resources for families together. So in the Mid-Atlantic region and across the country, we are seeing different models for instruction being implemented with procedures and plans rapidly evolving. This slide shows a few of the various approaches we are seeing. In Washington State, North Shore School District is trying to keep the school day as similar to their traditional day as possible, including using a virtual classroom model to keep students on track, as well as time for teachers to engage in professional development activities. In New York City, Success Academy Charter Schools includes in virtual instruction with a master teacher, 
with support from other teachers checking work and providing feedback daily. And in Chicago, Chicago Public Schools moved from providing instructional materials to merging digital and non-digital learning platforms with support from teachers via office hours, as an example. According to their website, students have digital and digital learning options and dedicated office hours where students and families can receive support from teachers through video conferencing, phone, or email. It's important to note that as best as we can tell from reporting and other research, approaches like Chicago are far more typical than North Shore or CS Academy's approaches. There are very few schools and districts that are yet doing something as ambitious as either of those approaches. Many districts are starting by providing supplemental resources and trying to figure out how to get beyond uh, while that they are ensuring equity. The Center for Reinventing Public Education and the American Enterprise Institute have been systematically examining district plans and describing trends. We also want to note that teachers are using a variety of mediums to communicate with students. A recent national survey of educators published by Ed Weekly found that 86% of educators used email to communicate with their students. They noted that a majority also communicated by posting written messages online or video conferencing. Also, 40% of teachers overall have used one-to-one -one phone calls, while 77% of special education teachers had one-to-one -one phone calls with their students. And so now I'm going to turn it back over to Steve to start diving into some promising practices. Steve? Thanks, Felicia. So schools, districts, and states deserve a great amount of credit for the hard work, for their hard work in responding to the issues that have arisen as a result of the pandemic. However, as we've talked about, talked with stakeholders in the region and beyond, we've heard loud and clear their concerns. Many have, many have shared with us that while they're trying to make the best of the situation, they're spending a lot of time responding to proverbial fires, that is creating quick solutions to immediate problems. As the reality of prolonged school closures with the expectation of continued educational support of students really begins to set in, educators have shared a desire for additional guidance on what to do, what practices to employ, and what research says about remote learning so that they can ground their decision making and approaches most likely to support their students. The rest of this session digs into this concern, first by sharing what we found during our exploratory scan of the literature on remote learning, and second, by diving into the particular challenges faced by students most historically underserved by the education system. We also want to acknowledge that we're sharing our findings here, but we recognize there are limitations on what educators can do. The starting point of any conversation for schools, districts, and states is to ask, what can we possibly do? For example, we know that many teachers themselves are providing remote instruction while watching their own children. There's only so much they can do in that particular situation but we want to use the findings here to illustrate what we know and explore the possibilities of that. So, as I said earlier, we're presenting on the findings of what was the first step of a larger systematic literature search. And we wanted to share a little bit about how we conducted this search. The first thing we did was um, to uh, set out a search to to the literature looking for studies, specifically literature reviews or rigorous studies involving a comparison group written within the last 10 years that grappled with the effectiveness of remote learning and remote learning practices in K-12 settings. We were fairly generous in defining remote learning so that it can include any sort of um, academic learning that could conceivably happen outside of the classroom, whether mediated through technological means or not. Given that we only explored literature for the last 10 years, however, nearly everything we found dealt with some form of technology-mediated strategy. Once we identified eligible studies, we documented what was studied and what the impact was. In total, we identified about 100 eligible studies involving a comparison group and nine literature reviews or meta-analyses. But here's the thing that got a little bit different for us than in a traditional scan of the literature. Before COVID-19, if we asked the question of how effective remote learning is, we'd probably want to compare remote learning to a traditional classroom. But as you know, the comparison right now is not a traditional classroom with face-to-face -face instruction. Instead, it's kids at home, not in a traditional classroom. And we didn't find any studies about teaching remotely during a pandemic. Today, schools and districts don't need to know whether a remote learning strategy is better than classroom instruction, 
They need to know which remote learning strategies can maximize learning and minimize harm when there is no classroom alternative. So we reviewed the literature with this in mind. So here's a little bit more about how we thought about identifying the promising strategies. We considered the following. If a strategy works better than face-to-face -face instruction, we consider that a win for the strategy. In other words, if it had positive impacts um, compared to traditional face-to-face -face instruction, we consider that a win. If a strategy works just as well as face-to-face -face instruction, meaning that it was no different than traditional classroom instruction, we consider that a win for the strategy. In fact, if we can find strategies that serve students remotely as effectively as we would have served them in the classroom, we'd consider that a pretty good success. And for strategies that work worse than face-to-face -face instruction, we can, we can try to identify key features of the strategies that distinguish them from more effective strategies. Those might help us identify things to avoid in our strategies. So let's turn to what we found. Again, we think there's something to be learned from all the studies, even those with negative impacts. And here, we summarize the findings from remote learning that has impacts that were negative for students compared to traditional instruction. Of all the studies, the only studies that had negative impacts were of those schools, of those studying schools or courses that were 100% online. While there are occasionally exceptions to this, these studies typically found that students in online schools or completing online coursework underperform compared to those attending physical schools or in-person schools or in-person courses. This might be a bit dis disconcerting at first. And so when we examine some of these studies a bit more closely, the authors repeatedly discuss the idea of synchronicity. Again, the idea of, of students completing coursework at the same time that the content is being delivered or receiving real-time support and feedback. The authors of these studies suggested that this might be an important reason why students on average were less successful in these settings compared to their peers who attended in person. So let's pivot from those studies with negative impacts and now look at what promising strategies we identified from studies that had positive or equal findings. Across the studies we examined, many involved a study of web-based applications. One involved using phones. Some looked at the use of technological devices without internet access. None have examined a model that we've seen emerge where schools send home packets of work. We did want to note that many of these studies occurred within the walls of the classroom. As I mentioned earlier, we were generous in our definition of remote learning. If a program or strategy could be used to support remote instruction, we included it regardless of whether the study was conducted in a school or not. But the headline here should be encouraging, especially given the alternative for students. While rigorous, more rigorous research is needed to definitively say this, here's what we found out about these strategies. First, we found the positive and neutral finding studies involved feedback, tutoring, or support strategies. Over 40% of all eligible studies grappled with various ways to provide additional support to students. One meta-analysis dedicated time to looking at effective practices for communicating with students virtually. Several studies explored so-called intelligent tutoring systems that tailored feedback or scaffolded instruction to students based on how they were responding to questions. Some involved collaboration, and one even, one even fostered conflict, that is, argumentative discourse to support persuasive writing. Next, some involved project-based learning. About 10% of studies involved project-based learning or using tools to explore content. Instruction involving authentic projects had positive impacts. One study finding a particularly positive impact for English language learners in their ability to explain scientific content. Some involved games or virtual simulations. Several studies found positive impacts on students engaging in learning through games or virtual simulations. Gaming and virtual simulations varied in complexity, but all were mediated through a digital device. And last, they planned for more than just content delivery. Over one-third of the studies involved an application or computer program delivered virtually or online. Of those that did not involve feedback, tutoring, or support services to students, these studies often involved instruction that was somewhat interactive, provided additional resources to students, or encouraged student choice. Two studies used technological devices as a medium to replace traditional content, 
had no impacts. For example, replacing writing an essay, excuse me, replacing writing an essay with writing a blog. So before moving on, we just want to acknowledge two things. These are the, are the strategies that have emerged from an initial analysis of a preliminary literature search, and more rigorous research is definitely needed on these strategies. But second, we also wanted to recognize that we realize that these strategies don't address all of your questions about what research says. For example, best ways to communicate or support families, best ways to provide professional development strategies for teachers, what exactly students should be focused on during these difficult times. We don't think you should lose sight of these questions. And at the end of this session, we'll conduct a stakeholder feedback survey, and we'd love to capture other directions that we could explore. But for now, Felicia is going to walk us through what we can learn from these studies. Thanks. So as you can see, under pre-COVID-19 circumstances, the studies we reviewed were all over the place. But educators have to start making decisions based on what's available right now. While more rigorous research is needed, we thought about the unique characteristics of these strategies and extrapolated what sorts of insights that schools, districts, and states consider. We made this table to highlight what we could learn from all of our studies, whether they had negative, positive, or neutral findings. First, with respect to online learning and courses, while the impacts were not positive, these findings illuminate with the need to foster synchronous time with instructors. Then, with feedback, tutoring, and support, we were initially curious about the amount of studies involving virtual feedback supports, but it reiterates education theory that learning happens through human interactions. These interactions build trust and create opportunities for learners to be pushed to think about new ideas in new and different ways. For project-based learning, at the core of project-based learning is the desire to solve problems, which is similar to a human-centered design approach. Humans are problem solvers, and projects connect students' desires to fix something, especially when the problems are connected to their lived experiences. When it comes to gaming or virtual simulations, we know that while schools are unlikely to be able to throw together virtual simulations, the research on gaming points to behavioral science. Behavioral science anticipates the friction points that may deter desirable behavior. Have you ever gotten a job and were automatically enrolled into a retirement plan? That's behavioral science. We all know that people want to save for retirement, but sometimes don't get around to it. Similarly, game design uses behavioral science to engage people into an activity. And just when the game is about to get boring, something happens to re-engage the gamer to participate longer. This approach can be used to help think about how to engage students in their learning and keep them engaged. Plus, games are just plain fun. And plan beyond content delivery. Technology for technology's sake probably won't get you too far, but there might be potential when the educator considers how the technology can augment the learner's experience through sharing additional useful resources or providing additional options for exploring the content. The key here is that technology can't supplement instruction, it can supplement instruction, but not replace it. So before we move on, we want to acknowledge that during a crisis like this one, Creating safe, nurturing, and authentic learning conditions is even more challenging than ever. And we cannot expect people to implement promising practices like we might have thought before this crisis. Making these sorts of changes requires changes at all levels, and educators need support and training to do all of this. Some teachers, schools, and districts will be able to pivot more easily than others, and implementation of promising strategies will be uneven at best. So implementing strategies to their full extent may not be feasible for your setting right now. However, we do want to invite you to think about what approaches you are using now, the extent they reflect these promising practices, and how you might be able to implement other potential promising practices to tackle this unprecedented situation. So schools, districts, and states are working to close the digital divide on the fly, but the reality is that for many students, virtual learning may not be feasible right now. While our next speaker will talk about equity issues, we hypothesize different ways that educators could apply these promising practices into insights to support their students. 
for example, when it comes to synchronicity, thinking about how teachers, administrators, and other school staff might connect with students in real time, such as through phone calls or holding virtual office hours. Thinking about how students receive feedback and connect with peers about their learning through phone calls or sharing pictures of their work, perhaps sharing feedback in the mail or by picking up feedback when they, uh, from the same place that they pick up meals. Thinking about what problems students are grappling with and how content can be taught to help them explore those problems to come up with their own solutions. And finally, trying to think ahead about where students will lose interest or become distracted. How can that be avoided? Could we implement competitions or other types of games? And what additional resources can be provided for students and families to help and support learning? And how can we provide clear directions for what to do and how to do it? So the last thing we'll say is this. If this conversation about research is making you feel like you want to know, well, so do we. In many ways, the rules for how we do school have just fundamentally changed, and we just don't have the exact evidence to tell you exactly what to do. But luckily, you have the power in your hands to do something about that. So here we're going to highlight two resources that are helpful in doing this. The first is the Evidence to Insights, or E2I Coach. The E2I Coach is a free online platform to help you generate evidence about what's working in your unique context. This is incredibly important because if something is working in your school or district, this applies rigorous methods to measure the impact. And if it's working, it creates an opportunity to share with others grappling with your questions exactly. The E2I Coach will be discussed in a webinar later this month. The E2I Coach is a free product developed and maintained by Mathematica with initial funding from the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Ed and recently upgraded with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And as I mentioned, the REL will be hosting a webinar on using the E2I Coach to refine your remote learning strategy on April 24th. The second is what to do with what you're learning from the data you're collecting about the various approaches that you're using. Using an evidence-informed continuous improvement cycle like the Learn, Innovate, Improve, or LI squared, helps you make sense of what you're learning and iteratively improves on those efforts in ways based on research. This is all to say, we have an opportunity to turn a situation that by all accounts is not great and use it to help change the reality of education for millions of students across the country. Um, so in a few minutes, we're going to turn it over to Heather Bennett to, to for a discussion on equity concerns, but uh, we thought we'd take a few minutes to see if there are any questions that have come up so far. Steve? Thanks, Felicia. Yeah, yeah. the first question that's yeah, the first question that's popped up um, is a question coming from, I assume, either a school administrator or a teacher. They're, they're asking, how might we, as a school administrator or a teacher, support parents who are helping children learn from home? What about parents for whom school was difficult or resources are limited? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's important to note that we did do a literature scan on best practices for parent engagement as part of this work, uh, especially those with uh, difficult access to resources. But the RELs as a group are starting to work on a series of parent tips, uh, documents that are derived from practice guides produced by the U.S. Department of Education's What Works Clearinghouse. They're going to be related to specific topics like early reading and elementary math, and they're going to be coming out on REL websites over the next few weeks. Um, I think we have a, a human response to this question as well. Um, some of ideas that you might consider might be talking with families, and when doing so, providing clear information and instructions when possible. Um, what kind of language we're using when we're um, talking to families, um, thinking about what the goals are, where parents can get more help if they need it, um, and when possible, providing parents with an answer key so they can be the one to provide students with feedback. Um, and some other ideas to consider might be holding office hours uh, for parents. And um, probably the most important thing, though, is setting realistic expectations for what can be accomplished given the world we're living in right now. Thanks. 
Yeah, we had a question come through. Um, it says, what, what would you say uh, should be an immediate next step for a principal or a district uh, to implement these practices? I think it's a good question um, because, you know, we often are faced in a situation where we learn about something and then we're left with the question of what to do. And I think um, this, this exploratory lit scan is kind of pointing to a few things to consider for principals and districts. I think the first is considering ways to support teachers and their ability to connect with students in real time, um, such as you know, encouraging them to hold virtual office hours or calling students and their families. And maybe understanding the extent to which teachers might face barriers in being able to do this as well and helping create solutions and, and ways for them to connect with, with their students. Um, other thoughts include, you know, maybe supporting and encouraging teachers to provide direct feedback to students and consider creative ways for connecting peers and learning such as through group, group email chains um, or, you know, group texts or things like that. Um, I, I also think there's an opportunity to uh, work with teachers to share ideas, best practices um, that they've encountered in keeping learning exciting, kind of speaking to that, uh, the gaming literature, what we learned from that, of how to keep activities motivating for when students might be completing them solo. Um, and, you know, one idea might be creating competitions where you have leaderboards where your students are kind of earning points along the way and getting excited that way. Um, I'm a former middle school math teacher, and I've never had a competition that my kids didn't get really excited about. And then, um, of course, critically, um, and Felicia kind of already talked about this a bit earlier, but working with teachers to create resources for students and families to support their learning. Um, I recently was uh, watching my nephews um, during their remote learning day, and uh, former teacher, former teacher coach, and I was reading the directions, and I was a bit confused about what my nephews needed to do. And so if I'm confused, you know, I can only imagine. And so thinking about how to provide clear directions to families about ways they can best support their students and connecting them with resources that could help them um, um, help their students um, make the most of this situation. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it looks like we have another question about how federal and state agencies can support districts during this COVID-19 crisis. Um, I I'll just say that we know everyone has been responding to this in real time and putting a lot of time and energy into making a difference for students and their families and their larger communities. Um, so I think it's probably about continuing on with those efforts, you know, identifying policies that are helping and considering providing specific guidance, uh, especially for populations of students that are not historically well served. And in the spirit of collaboration and not evaluation, thinking about how to push districts to think about continuous improvement. For example, finding ways that districts can track progress and share what's working across other districts and schools. Great. Um, and we're going to pass it off to Heather in just a second. But um, someone just asked us for a reminder of where they can get um, some of the resources we referenced and actually a list of the references that we use as part of the literature search. And um, we just wanted to point out that you can get access to a full list of those citations using the resource list widget which you can find, it's got a little green file icon at the bottom of your screen. And we'll also be posting that list with the recording of this webcast. But that being said, um, we are excited to hand things over to Dr. Heather Bennett of the Pennsylvania School Boards Association. Heather, it's all you. Hello, how are you? Um, it's really great to be here. And I'm excited to um, discuss and explore strategies to promote educational equity during remote learning. And so um, I start off by trying to frame uh, the problem here. Um, we've already had a problem with digital inequity before this pandemic. Um, this issue is not new. And the National Digital Inclusion Alliance defined digital equity as equal access to digital tools, resources, and services to increase digital knowledge and skills. Um, Access to digital resources, unfortunately, um, have not been equally distributed. High poverty schools, rural schools, and low income English learner and students with disabilities and their families in Pennsylvania and across the nation are disproportionately harmed by the lack of access to digital tools and resources. Students and parents who do not have access to digital tools and resources are 
typically at a disadvantage in their academic progress, making it difficult for students to complete homework assignments, projects, research assignments, and of course it impedes parental communication and engagement with the school. This equity gap can also be compounded due to the cost, lack of in infrastructure, and discrimination in the investment distribution of services to certain communities and populations. So this is the issue before the pandemic. What we're seeing during this pandemic is that COVID-19 has exposed and exasperated um, as well as compounded the digital inequity problem and has forced districts to react quickly to provide devices, um, really discuss internet access and instruction so that children will not be at a further disadvantage. Unfortunately, the students that are experiencing the most hardship right now in this, in this life are the same students um, in schools and communities that desperately needed these resources before the pandemic. Um, the opportunity gap between districts, schools, and students um, unfortunately may only widen um, during and after this pandemic. And so I really wanted to couch this as a major equity issue here because that's exactly what it is. Um, to, so today we're going to talk and discuss three main digital equity learning concerns. Um, access to digital devices, um, access to connectivity, um, which is like internet, high-speed broadband internet, and then also um, access to instruction. So let's start off with um, access to hardware or devices. Um, when we're talking about with, uh, digital learning hardware, we're typically talking about computers, laptops, desktops, and notebooks, and of course mobile devices such as smartphones and tablets. But here's the problem. Typically, what we see in research is that high poverty schools um, and also um, economically disadvantaged students um, have limited access to these devices. Um, even if students have access to a device at home, the device may not be conducive to complete school assignments given to them by their teacher or school. Um, there is a difference between writing a research paper on a smartphone or conducting a research assignment on a smartphone than on a laptop or notebook. So we have to understand when we think about devices that they're, they differ as well in access and usability. And of course, according to the 2016 U.S. Census, smartphone only households tended to be low income, black and Latinx um, families and students. So how has COVID-19 exasperated this issue? Um, I, I saw that there are three major issues to discuss here. Um, providing devices to every student um, is extremely a, a huge budgetary concern um, uh, for district administrators and school board directors. Um, for the most part, devices are expensive. And districts are, in this point, are trying to obtain the resources to purchase these devices for their students. Um, for districts, some districts waited until the pandemic to provide devices for every student, while some districts had already had a one-to-one -one plan um, prior to the pandemic. So we're seeing an inequity gap right there in, in that. Um, also, questions about the fact that devices were typically, um, if they did have devices, they were typically provided to high school and maybe middle school students. Um, but now districts are thinking about how they can provide devices to um, fit the needs of their elementary school students. Another issue in, in, this, in this framing is devices in the learning platforms may, are, are not compatible or easy to use. Um, so the second issue I wanted to talk about is providing students with a device um, safely, um, which calls into effect this idea of sanitation. Um, one Pennsylvania superintendent indicated that providing devices for all of her students will not, would not be the problem, but distribution would be. So there's issues of sanitation in, um, in terms of sanitation and concerns regarding that. How are you going to provide the di devices to the students who need it the most in a safe manner when we're in this process of social distancing? Um, also, the third, um, the third issue in this piece is learning how to use the device. Um, getting a device is one step, but teachers, parents, and students also have to be aware of the device features and learn how to utilize that device for it to be effective. Um, so how do we deal that with that? How do we, how are we, what are ways in which to mitigate this inequity that we see in terms of accessing devices? Um, well, first, it's important to provide devices to students with the most need through mail and or 
a specified distribution site, and we have to take into consideration the safety of staff and families in distributing devices. We know that some school districts have decided to mail um, their devices um, in the, uh, using, utilizing the mail to, to the most needy families. Um, so, for example, multilingual learners, students with disabilities, or students living in public housing. Um, some districts have decided to utilize um, their already process of providing meals for students as a distribution uh, opportunity as well. Um, again, it's extremely important that we take into consideration the safety of the staff and families and provide them with the uh, protection uh, materials so that the student, the families, as well as the staff in, in place are safe if they are providing a device in person. Um, Another, alter another um, way to mitigate the inequity is consider alternative, alternate types of devices or additional software needed by students with disabilities when providing school-owned devices. Um, students with disabilities require, uh, may require different devices, um, so please take into consideration accessibility um, based upon who your student is and what they need. It's important to test the learning platform on the device and survey learners to assess compatibility and usability. Um, this is kind of related to the second point, but remember that apps and um, applications work differently, um, even on our iPhones or Androids, right? So um, some people are iPhone users, some people are Android users, and just usability is different depending on that. But let's think about that in the same way as our learning devices. Um, applications, learning platforms will be, will be utilized differently depending on the device. So it's important that um, we really survey students and survey learners to see what's easy for them and what is accessible to them. Um, partner with technology companies to provide devices. That's important. It's important to seek out grant funding. Um, the Pennsylvania Department of Education um, has this emergency continuity of education equity grant is intended to provide additional financial support to districts and schools with high percentage of students um, who, who need it the most. So um, this grant will go to purchasing hardware, software, technology infrastructure, assistive technology for students with disabilities, supports for English learners, professional development for personnel, students and caregivers, and much more. And the last point that I wanted to get at in regards to um, access to devices is that we need to provide how-to resources on the website. And if our students and our families don't have access or do have um, adequate internet access, it's important that we utilize the other technology that we have in our uh, availability, and that's our phones. Um, and so consider using an automatic mated call system to provide a phone number for tech assistance when needed. So these are just some of these are just some of the ways in which we can mitigate this inequity that we see when in terms of accessing this, this de accessing devices during this pandemic. So we're going to move on to the second um, issue, equity issue that I, I would like to address, and that is access to connectivity. Um, let's start off with the problem. Access to hardware means absolutely little if the school and the student lacks internet connectivity. There is an extreme digital gap identified by class, race, and often geographic location um, when it comes to internet access. Um, without access to connectivity, students cannot access the same resources and participate in the same opportunities as fully as those students in schools and households with adequate connectivity and internet um, access. So for an example, according to the 2015 FCC report, um, it indicated that in Pennsylvania, there are about 800,000 Pennsylvanians, Pennsylvanians or 6% of, uh, of the population who lack robust, reliable, high-speed internet. And majority of them are coming out of rural districts um, and rural um, communities. But also, 31% of that number are also coming from urban areas as well. So how is COVID-19 exasperating this problem? Um, so Due to the COVID-19 and the spread of the virus and the need to social distance, schools have shuttered across the country and in Pennsylvania, yet the requirement to implement instruction is still important for schools to push forward. And the only way to conduct instruction um, is through some form of digital learning opportunities. However, the cost of internet service to households are, can be problematic. 
um, families may not have the, the money to be able to afford high-speed broadband Internet. And even though these numbers are going down in terms of the pricing, um, low-income families are still less likely to have access to high-speed Internet. So again, according to research, um, 2016 U.S. Census indicated that only 21% of low-income households had connectivity, compared to 80% of households of $150,000 or more. The cost of Internet certainly deters low-income families from purchasing reliable broadband Internet. And if we think about this from a racial lens, nationally, 66% of white students, 63% of Asian, and 64% of mixed students have home Internet access. This is a higher percentage compared to 53% of Black, 52% of Latinx, and 49% of American Indian students um, in the United States. So I would also like to iterate that even if there are services that provide cheaper broadband plans, is this information getting to the communities that need it the most? Need to the most. So even if they are being able, they are able to afford, or if they're, the numbers are low, that they can't afford um, broadband internet services, we have to make sure that this information is being communicated um, to families. So another element that I wanted to talk about is lack of internet infrastructure for cost-effective high-speed connectivity in remote locations. And I'm pretty much talking about rural um, areas and communities and school districts. Um, rural areas often lack the fiber infrastructure to provide cost-effective high-speed connectivity. Um, and so even if the schools themselves have um, the connectivity ability, um, what we notice is that students and teachers who live further from the school um, may not have the same internet speed or connection. Um, so what we've seen in Pennsylvania and probably in most parts of the Mid-Atlantic region and across the country is that um, in rural districts, in one of our school districts, 50% of our families did not have access to um, um, internet, um, high-speed broadband internet, and which has caused a lot of stresses on families and staff, um, both emotionally and economically. Um, so it's really important that we recognize that it's, it's harder for parents and it's harder for even teachers to administer their lessons or even provide for their own kids if they are further away or they don't have access to high-speed internet um, capabilities. And I also wanted to mention here, since I have the time too, is intersectionality is important here. We have a lot of poor children living in rural spaces. So even so, let's even talk about the compoundedness of the problem of not even having access to broad speed internet at the same time, also um, maybe not being able to afford it. So we have to think about all these things in, in, in practice. Um, and so let's talk about ways to mitigate um, this problem. So first, we suggest that maybe it's important to partner with internet providers for free Wi-Fi for the most economically disadvantaged families. And of course, lifting caps on data usage. This is important. Um, provide hotspots for families and staff. And we suggest that you check your E-rate state site or um, for a list of resources and free community hotspots. Um, your E-rate um, state website should provide you with a, a lot of resources to, to help and assess what areas um, that your families and your communities and your students can access. Um, it's important to, um, to provide a map of community hotspots and Wi-Fi locations on your website, but also, if, of course, if of students don't have access to the um, don't have um, high speed internet capabilities. It's important also to think about how this can be understood through phone call or the mail. Um, another thing is utilizing the parking lot. Um, in a lot of these areas, um, such as restaurants, libraries, and even schools, um, these are areas in which um, students can have access to Wi-Fi internet. Um, and it's also important to survey and assess transportation barriers for students to assess these hotspots. How are kids actually getting to these hotspots, right? Uh, uh, in rural spaces, some of them have, uh, you know, fashioned their buses to have Wi-Fi or hotspots in, the, in their school buses that are going around in these neighborhoods so kids can have access to some type of Wi-Fi internet. So it's important to provide a map but also be creative in where and, and where and what location that we're providing these hotspots in. Of course, use public television stations or radio to promote instruction. Uh, if you go on the website on the um, public radio or public television stations, you'll notice that they'll have a curriculum. They'll have a lot of resources. And they'll also indicate the subject matter of those shows. 
It's important also to modify online instruction for students utilizing paper packets. So for students who legit do not have access to connectivity, it's important to utilize a mixture of digital learning, but also paper packets so that they can able to be a part of the conversation and to be, a, to be able to get instruction in some form or fashion. I will also say this, read blogs by rural teachers. I think are extremely important because they have they are, they know how to strategize ways to deal with the internet connectivity issue better than anyone. Um, I read a wonderful blog recently by a rural teacher in Pennsylvania um, who had amazing suggestions about how to um, mitigate the impacts of internet connect uh, lack of internet connectivity um, for herself and her family and for her students, and I think that's really helpful. Um, so let's move on to the last. Um, issue and topic um, that we're going to focus on today, and that's going to talk about access to instruction. Um, so what is the problem, okay? Integrating technology into the classroom and the desire to utilize technology as an integral teaching tool in classrooms has definitely also shaped the digital divide between district schools, teachers, and students. The use of technology in classrooms have definitely changed the judicial model of teaching from instruction to facilitation, right? And so there are two major issues I really wanted to talk to you about when it comes to access to instruction. And that first issue is access to training. Teachers and parents definitely need professional development on how to utilize these devices, as well as how to engage in instruction utilizing a digital learning platform. Um, this is extremely important, and especially for teachers who are not used to moving from uh, the traditional model from instruction to facilitation. With this format, students are now going to be co-facilitators with them. And then in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis, parents are the ones having to really, for the most part, um, help their students um, and also instruct their students as well. And so it's important that both factors, both teachers and parents, um, are well versed in how to utilize these um, digital learning platforms as well as instructional uh, measures. Um, the next is choice of instruction, providing instruction that meets the needs of diverse learners. Remember, equity is providing students what they need, what they need to be successful as, as well as in the format that they need as well. So it's important that instruction from a digital learning platform um, is really reflective of our diverse learners. So moving forward, um, we're going to talk about some key questions that um, I feel are really important in this conversation in terms of access to training. And I feel like you should, um, these are questions to ask yourself and your district as you're developing a plan for digital learning in your, in your district. Um, so first is, has the district implemented training for staff parents and caregivers regarding the importance of digital learning, the use of digital devices, digital learning platforms, and the video conferencing application. Um, the hard part for a lot of teachers is integrating the lesson that you would normally do in your classroom to a virtual education format, and that requires training. Um, and also understanding how to integrate social emotional learning and culturally responsive practices also into the curriculum. The second question is, what supports exist for teachers, staff, parents, and caregivers for digital learning, which requires analyzing supports and resources and providing that information will go a long way. So how, what are the supports that you already have in place and also what supports um, um, have you grown to learn while you're um, moving in this direction? That information should definitely be um, available for teachers and parents. And three, what biases and fears do teachers, staff, parents, and caregivers have toward digital learning? Okay. So in terms of choice of instruction, let's talk about some questions to ask yourself. The first and probably one of the first more imp most important questions is the instruction tailored to meet the needs of vulnerable populations. Um, we're talking about economically disadvantaged students. We're talking about students in special education, English learner students, and homeless students. Um, we recognize that these, um, that these populations and these student populations require additional support, but also support tailored to meet their specific needs. And so it's important that we're thinking about in terms of instruction, how are we reaching these students? Second, is the instruction tailored to, to meet social emotional learning and focus on mental health needs? 
Um, I'm going to go in a little bit on this, but it's important that we recognize um, how important uh, mental health and mental health is in this time frame um, prior to the pandemic, but also during the pandemic as well. Um, third question is instruction culturally responsive, right? Fourth is how will you promote academic rigor? And, and so these are the questions that we, I felt that we felt that it would be really important to discuss as we think about ways to mitigate these, uh, this specific equity issue. So let's start off with the first um, point, which is providing training for teachers, parents, and caregivers. It doesn't matter. It, it does matter. I'm not going to say it doesn't matter. It, it matters what you utilize in the format and the mediums that you do use. But you can utilize. You can use multiple different formats to move this forward, utilizing webinars, videos, guides. But it's important that, that you not just not only educate your teachers, but also your parents and caregivers on how to utilize these devices effectively. Um, so utilize your website as a place for um, some of these uh, um, uh, spaces, some of these trainings, but also with your own teachers, making sure that you're spending time and you have the time set out for, 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 for a full staff professional development on utilizing these um, devices and learning platforms and also learning instruction. To focus students in instruction, it's so important that we're centering students in this work. And so that requires us to really think about content that reflects the experiences and identities of students and families. When we're choosing videos, when we're choosing text, that we're reflective of the different cultural identities of our, of our students. And, our, and, and also making sure that we're recognizing um, that they feel like they belong in, within the instruction as well. So let's make sure that we are really focusing and centering our kids' identities and cultural uh, spaces and frameworks into our curriculum. Allow students to choose topics and engage student voice in decision making. This is also extremely important that we're making sure that our kids are, again are centered here and that, um, that because of this framing, we have the opportunity to be very flexible um, and, and in terms of teacher and administrative um, focused instruction. So it's, keep that in mind in the place. And so in terms of like, uh, plans for the future, it's also important to engage students in that as well, making sure that students are a part of these conversations. Incorporate group activities, i.e. monitor breakout rooms or learning platforms. We have communal learners, and so it's important that we're utilizing in terms of teaching practices um, that we are also incorporating students into groups and creating opportunities for them to play games, opportunities for them to work together as a team but also from a social emotional learning standpoint as well, it's important that students are interacting with each other. Engage in project-based learning. In one district in Pennsylvania, uh, a district offered a project-based instructional menu for students where they had to pick two options out of that menu. And, and this is an opportunity for students to A, choose their topic, um, but also engage more effectively um, with uh, the material itself and also being able to do experiential learning as well. And some of these projects could be done without internet. And so these are examples of how to utilize and mitigate the impacts of all these inequities that we're seeing in our spaces. Um, check in with students consistently about their fears, interests, and concerns. Um, it's important to be aware that your students are having a disparate experience due to COVID-19. Um, for an example, their parent, family members may be sick. Um, some, um, may, some may live in households where their parents lost their jobs or their parents are essential workers so their parents may not be available. Our kids are dealing with a lot of anxieties and fears, and so it's important that we're checking in with them at the beginning um, and continuously to make sure that they're okay. And, also, um, it's important to build relationships. Pay attention to the students who are not there or are not engaged. And this is not just for teachers, this is just for administrators and district um, staff as well, making sure that we're paying attention to our kids and who they are and where they are in the midst of this um, crisis. So the next step is um, recognize your biases towards online learning as well as biases towards students and families. And this is, not, again, not just something we think about from a classroom mindset, but as a school climate space as well. Um, for a lot of teachers, but not just teachers, school board directors, um, administrators, um, they're being asked to do something that they have never done 
Um, they're being asked to utilize platforms that they have never used. And it's important that we understand those biases and concerns um, so that they can, we can have a nice transition to getting them on board with these um, new, new spaces um, in education formats. And so it's important to address um, biases in learning. And also it's important to recognize that you can still perpetuate biases, stereotypes about certain kids and parents if we're not available as well. So it's definitely important to check our own individual personal biases towards our, our students and families. Um, so one of the things, the next thing is to engage in active digital instruction as much as possible. Um, active instruction, active digital learning instruction includes access to technology, using coding design, immersive simulations, game playing, interactions with experts in media production. Um, active active uh, technology focuses on creation, while passive focuses on consumption. I'm going to say this. This is actually hard to do, um, and it's a huge connectivity challenge. Um, so active digital instruction needs to be balanced with connectivity. And we know that video download, streaming, and online meetings require a lot of bandwidth, um, which is a problem with those who do not have, who, who do not have strong broadband ability or use their phone data. So it's important that this is just a solution that you can work towards, even if you're not unable to accomplish that right now. Again, as I said earlier, embed social emotional learning and culturally responsive practices into the curriculum. And in terms of special education and specific um, groupings of students, it's important that we consider a team approach. When I say that, I'm talking about parents, caregivers, family liaisons, teachers, caseworkers, specialists, community leaders. When we're talking about developing instruction and curriculum for special education learners, supporting and developing instruction for English learners, supporting homeless students and their families, but in all honesty, we should be utilizing um, these resources um, and this, this approach in terms of a team partnership with all of our students. When we're talking about curriculum, when we're talking about practices, and even future learning plans, um, it's important that we are thinking about this as a community approach and not just as one individual person. And then my last point here is this. We have to think consistently, um, uh, consistency. We have to make instruction and learning process as routine as possible despite the circumstances. Because of this pandemic, because of COVID-19, students are out of routine. So how can we make this remote learning space uh, a place of, of safety? Um, so in terms of thinking about scheduling, classroom, classroom management, grading, teacher office hours, um, even with our like even with our other entities, how do we create a space where people or students and our kids and our families feel safe in these environments? And so um, thinking about how can we make this as consistent and as routine as possible is important here. Um, and so I know I talked about a lot, and so now I'm going I think we're gonna move on to Q and A and I'm gonna return this back to Steve to facilitate Q and A. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Heather. That was just <laughs> That was so much wonderful information. Really appreciate you sharing that. I think um, one set of questions as we're reviewing um, the Q&A is, if you have any additional thoughts about how to support and serve children with, children with disabilities and their families, I know you've shared a bit already, but is there anything else you wanted to say on that? Um, I do. I, it's important to recognize that they are diverse learners as well. We group them all as like special education, but um, our students who, are, who have disabilities or who have IEPs um, have different learning needs and challenges, right? And so it's important that we make adjustments to their IEP and work with teachers um, to help them make adjustments um, work with teachers and parents to make adjustments to their IEP um, through this virtual setting. Um, it's important that we're supporting uh, 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 these, these differences and challenges together as a, through a group, uh, a, a team partnership. Um, I think it's important to seek out software for the needs of your kids. Um, and uh, there's really a great um, website that kind of has a whole lot of uh, resources specific about different ways um, uh, we can work with students with special needs and uh, it's educatingalllearners.org I think has a lot of I, I call it like kind of like a, a brain dump of all the different resources out there for special needs students. Another I was doing some more research on this and another thing is like just 
just even how we are implementing our instruction. Um, so I read that utilizing larger fonts, really thinking about the way our lighting is working through our um, through these digital learning platforms, turning on captions and videos. Um, these are just certain things you should to think about to do when we're talking about working with and including um, a, a students with special needs into um, the conversation, but also into, into the instruction. But again, it's really important to think about it as the fact that it really depends on their IEP and really working with an, as a community partnership with parents, liaisons, specialists, um, teachers, um, and special um, ed teachers as well to think about how do we format their IEP to fit this new learning platform and this new digital learning space um, is important to note. Um, yeah, uh, again, it really is important about, it really just matters for the student and, and recognizing the need to plan accordingly and give the planning needed to, to be able to um, move this forward before our kids. You know, Heather, I think um, related to that, we're seeing several questions just wanting to get to specifics, uh, whether it's the federal grants or um, uh, grants for devices that you talked about earlier, uh, a page summarizing the ideas for active digital instruction, um, those sorts of things. And you just referenced one resource that folks could go to. Would there be any other kind of places you would recommend folks check out that they could find additional kind of information on these, uh, dare I say, nuts and bolts kind of uh, questions that folks are bringing up here? I think it's important to, uh, first of all, check out state resources are important. Um, um, in terms of nuts and bolts uh, uh, spaces, um, I don't have a list right now in front of me specifically about all the, all the specific needs, but I can definitely provide some resources at the end of, uh, um, after this um, webinar is over. Again, it's really, really important um, here to recognize that our, these, our kids need different resources, and that's why I don't have specifics, um, outlying specifics right now. Um, it's important also to recognize what their IEP requires as well. And so I, I'm very cautious to say this is what you should do, X, Y, and Z. It's important really to take a really a, a, a team approach and making sure that we're like with parents and students and, and, and teachers as well as specialists as well and making sure they have access to their specialists during this time frame as well is important. But I will also go into this as um, I will also go into this. It's important to develop and maintain routines here. Um, I think especially with, uh, um, with some of our students who require um, uh, cognitive or even behavioral support, it is extremely important that we're creating a space where um, our devices are usable for them, that they're accessible, um, and that uh, it meets their needs specifically, that we are um, uh, making sure that there's a routine in place that um, the parents know the routine, the teachers know the routine, the students know the routine, so we can make things as simple as possible, uh, uh, make sure that things are going to move uh, uh, um, as, as easy as possible and d despite this extreme um, shift and change in, in education um, practice um, as a whole. So I, I think in terms of, again, I said earlier, I'm not, I don't really have specifics like X, Y, and Z, but I definitely think about in terms of a, world, a whole rounded approach is, one, utilize your team, making sure that you're sitting there and discussing how to um, uh, reformat the IEP to fit the digital learning spaces. Um, two, making sure that there's a routine in place uh, is important. And also making sure that when you're giving instruction that um, it fits the specific needs of that student um, are the biggest um, takeaways that I can, can provide right now. Um, but again, I will provide some more resources after um, um, this webinar is over. Thanks, Heather. Um, maybe two more questions for you. Um, this next question, I think, kind of uh, follows up on that pretty logically. And something that I, I kind of personally resonate in thinking about talking to the young people in my family. Um, and the question is, how do we convince teachers it's important to check in with students and ask about their fears and concerns and how they're doing? Um, uh, the person goes on to say, you know, a fear about triggering um, kind of that the experience of asking that could be triggering or, you know, traumatizing for them. I suppose the flip side could be true, too, that our kids are picking up on 
something's not not normal <laughs> and not talking about that could also be kind of odd to children but yeah I would love to hear your thoughts on on how to convince teachers and maybe even approaches for teachers to broach the subject with with their kids we can start off kind of at the very beginning of the lesson, right? And just kind of give them a check-in. And you have all those wonderful, I don't know if you, I don't know what virtual platforms anyone's using for Zoom. You have all those emojis and all those special things that you can utilize to kind of check in and to say, hey, are you okay? Give me a thumbs up. If not, you know, or just kind of ask a question at the very beginning of the day, like, how are you feeling? Um, get, name one good thing, one um, thing you're concerned about. Um, during this time. And this is kind of a social emotional learning practice. And so just it creates kind of a community from the very beginning. Um, but also it can create a routine as well. I talked about earlier about routines. If, you, if you're utilizing that same format throughout the whole, throughout the lesson, then um, throughout the instruction, throughout the time, throughout the instruction, you start to recognize that kids will be ready for it and they might start to engage a little bit more. Um, also, um, you talked earlier, Steve, um, in the early part of the presentation about office hours. Um, if students are not uncomfortable talking about it as a group um, uh, through these platforms, having you know teaching teacher office hours are is extremely important method as well. Um, again, um, having the teacher share about their concerns and fears is important. Students are not the only ones going through. Um, uh, this issue it, it's it's everybody and so um it's important that teachers are um teachers are uh, able to share about their own concerns about their own fears to kind of bring more students in again this is about building partnerships and building community at the end of the day and uh having that being a part of the the process the classroom day is important and i'm not just talking about teachers and students Administrators working with teachers, asking them how they are doing, making that a part of um, any type of professional development or instruction. Um, school board members, when they are um, meeting together, um, uh, just having, having a space for humanity, I think is extremely important to start off any, any program or meeting. It certainly resonates with me. It reminds me of some some research around early childhood and letting kind of children take the lead, and and we can apply that to all levels of of people. You know, whether they're young children to uh, older children to adults. Uh, I think there's a lot of that that resonates with me in terms of the value of that. Um, I think one more question for you, Heather, and then we're going to turn to kind of answer some questions that came up during um, an earlier portion when we were discussing the lit review. But uh, one of our advanced questions, Heather, um, asked about how schools should start thinking about getting ready for the next school year. And I know that seems so far away. We're still trying to figure out how to get through this school year. But, um, you know, when, when hopefully when kids get back into class in the fall, you know, some of the equity issues that you've discussed might be playing out in new and different ways or exacerbated ways. Would love to hear your thoughts on uh, what thinking um, schools and districts and states could be putting into place now to get ready for that. I think it's important to recognize that that what we're seeing right now is uh, is districts and teachers and, 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 and school leaders moving very rapidly and quickly and also very flexible, like recognizing how flexible they can and, and trying to provide instruction for students. And so it is extremely important um, that we start to, to really look at our data um, looking at our data before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and after the pandemic to start to think about what are barriers to opportunity, what, what, how have disparity, what are the disparities um, that existed, and also how have they widened um, uh, in, through this process. So really thinking about that data piece is important. If you have not conducted an equity audit yet, it, I think it's extremely important to do one. Um, right after this pandemic, I mean, right after um, it at least gets to some semblance of normal. Um, I think it's also in, it's in order to plan for a uh, future, uh, 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 for the new school year. It's also important to recognize that you have to include parents and student voices into whatever planning process is necessary. Because how COVID-19 impacts 
uh, how has it impacted different demographic groups has been very disparate. Um, so it's important that you really are including the voices and really the stories of different groups of students and parents and families and community members into whatever planning um, um, space as well, uh, the planning structure um, moving forward. Um, it's also important to recognize um, that you have to start thinking about this through an equity lens. Um, I think a lot of districts are recognizing more and more every day that what we're seeing is an issue, I, I call it an inequity bomb or an inequity accelerant. Um, we've, we're throwing gasoline, COVID-19 and the impact has been like throwing gasoline on an already explosive um, fire. So it is also really important that we start to look at our policies and our practices um, as a whole and start to recognize, okay, how will we um, perpetuating inequity through those through those spaces and of course professional development so and I, I think in terms of planning for next year I think it's important that districts are starting to think about this um, systematically I know it's crazy right now I know we're all in a crisis right now but it's so important that we start to put some things in order at least some steps in whether it's um, really develop it, finding, getting task force members, getting them, getting them involved, and just starting that, and just kind of looking at the data from before, and sort of looking at the data while it's going on to start moving towards a plan for the future. Because it's the plan for the future that we really have to worry about. Because I think we're going to see widening um, disparity gaps because of um, the outcomes of the pandemic, and so uh, it's important that we're starting off the ground running um, when. Uh, um, when this crisis has come to a, a close. Thanks, Heather. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of makes me think that in a lot of ways we have we have kind of the thinking and tools. Those things exist and are out there mm -hmm. to help us tackle the challenges we're facing now. But it's about using them in new and creative ways to truly really make a difference in kids' lives. And I don't know if that's taking it a step too far, but that's kind of what I'm hearing from you as you're, you're sharing your thoughts, and, and thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, so we are going to take, I think, maybe three more questions um, that have come through, um, and uh, then we'll start to close up. Um, we did receive a question about, um, so Felicia had discussed the Evidence to Insights tool, um, and someone asked if this tool, the E2I tool, would help schools determine the quality of the remote learning plans based on a set of quality standards. Felicia, did you want to tackle that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the E2I coach is a tool that will help you determine whether you're moving the needle on student outcomes that you're prioritizing. For example, whether providing synchronous content increases engagement, climate completion compared to um, providing asynchronous content, but it won't assess remote learning plans based on a set of quality standards. Um, and I think we invite everyone to, to join the upcoming webinar, which will dive into that tool a bit more. Steve, did you want to tackle a, a few other questions before we wrap up? Yeah, um, we had a question about what the literature says about supporting learners of um, English and what, when they require support to acquire language while also learning the content. And we thought this was a real good question. And admittedly, we've only begun to scratch the surface of this in our, in our literature scan. Um, so we won't be able to definitively say the literature says X, um, unfortunately. Um, what we can say is, you know, we did find positive impacts on English language learners in a variety of interventions. Uh, one involved a website-based vocabulary game, one involved interactive inquiry instructions, and um, another involved collaborative learning activities. Um, and we could imagine, you know, so you might, you might think about what those sort of things, you know, collaborative learning activities, for instance, students talking to each other. You could think about activities that you could set up in place uh, that would allow students to talk to each other about the content that they're learning to tackle that. Um, you know, so, but again, we're just beginning to scratch the surface of this, and we could imagine other supports might be needed depending on the content and level of language acquisition that the student has. Um, we also received a question um, about synchronous versus asynchronous um, learning. Um, this person says, I'm still curious about um, synchronous versus asynchronous, finding that since digital inequities lead to more asynchronous opportunities, what is it about synchronous and can those aspects be, uh, somehow be improved or increased in asynchronous offerings? And our response is, we agree, we're pretty curious about this too and want to learn more. 
Um, we wonder, you know, kind of our wondering based on our understanding of the literature um, at this point, and again, needing to dig more into this, our wondering was if it might have something to do with the combination of real-time feedback, accountability, and relationship building that you do in person. And so our wonderings were, you know, how could you create opportunities to give these sorts of sentiments in, a, in an asynchronous setting? You know, for example, maybe it's watching a video or reading a text and then having a structured follow-up call with a friend to talk about it or, you know, have a small group check-in with a teacher. Um, but we definitely agree that this question is, is worth more exploration. And so I think, you know, what this kind of uh, response and, and hopefully the spirit of what we've shared with you all today really gets at, you know, there are some kind of arrows pointing in some directions, it seems, from literature, from our very, you know, um, exploratory literature scan that are pointing to these promising strategies. And it's up to us to kind of make sense of that and think about what works, what we think might work, and then trying it out. And then hopefully using those continuous improvement cycles, evidence-informed continuous improvement cycles to monitor where we're at and, and steps we could take and, and learning from what we're doing to share those best practices with others. So thank you all so much for those questions, and I'm going to pass it back to Felicia, who's going to close us out. Thanks, Steve. So um, in the next few weeks, we really want you to look for more resources from the REL, including an infographic directly related to this webinar. The IS website on this slide will provide a full list of COVID-19 related resources all across the country including a link for the next upcoming event, which is a quick chat from REL Central called Strategies to Support Remote Learning Along a Continuum of Internet Access. And that event is on April 16th. Um, in addition, we also invite you to visit Comp Center COVID-19 Compendium for more resources for schools. And I'll mention that both of these links are available on the dashboard on this webinar. So we want to hear from you. Um, at the end of this webinar, I'm going to ask you to complete a brief survey. We want your feedback on today's webinar, of course, but we also would like to hear more about the related topics that you would like to learn more about. And as a reminder, this webinar recording will be posted on our website along with a full list of citations that we use as part of the webinar. So I just once again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This slide provides contact information for all of the speakers. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have further questions. Thank you.